did the pursuit of wisdom. The second week we did the pursuit of purpose, and tonight will be the pursuit of abiding. So one of the big questions I want to ask before we get started, actually, that pertains to this, when we talked about abiding, the opposite of the thing that is of, of abiding is striving. So is the key to this life, is the key to this life striving? And I wanted to define striving because I know sometimes when we say that word, it kind of gets confused. It more, more than less, uh, people don't really know what it means when we're talking about striving and abiding. And I use the regular definitions uh, in dictionaries to speak about it, but we know the Bible also speaks on it more, and we will get into that as well. So a definition for striving, the first one I have is to devote serious effort or energy, quote unquote, endeavor. And I find that interesting because that's what it is. You actually hear it in a lot of things that you hear today, whether it be uh, motivational speeches, whether it be in the sense of instructing, whether it be in the sense of teaching. And striving on its own is, is, is a sense of, of energy and it's a sense of movement. And that's a part of what we can be doing, but I wanna also um, conclude it and let you, uh, tell you and persuade you how um, abiding is, is more um, the way that we should be going with. But that was one definition. And the second definition for striving is to struggle in opposition to contend. And um, one of the biggest things I always think of when I think of, of striving, um, in essence of laying it down, is to stand in all of God. And Ecclesiastics, in the book that we were reading uh, for the past couple weeks with Ecclesiastics, as this will be the last week that we'll be doing and ending in that, Ecclesiastics chapter 5, verse 1 to 6 speaks on it and it says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Who do not know what they do wrong? Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your hearts. And to, to utter anything before God, God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. And as a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of fools when there are many words. And when you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has, not he has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow Excuse me, it's better not to vow than to make a vow and not to fulfill. And they were speaking specifically on, on the commitment and standing uh, in, in all of God and, and having reverence for him. And that's specifically where I want to go with when it comes to defining abiding. And abiding has five uses within the verb. One of it means to remain, to remain, to continue, to stay. Second one would be to have one's abode, to dwell, and to reside. The third one is to put up with, to tolerate. The fourth is to endure, sustain, or withstand without yielding or submitting. And the fifth is to wait or to await. And when, many of those things I'll actually be speaking of in the, the verses to, to, uh, to come. But mainly within that sense of abiding. So abiding is about being in a place, as they were seeing even with uh, chapter 5, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. So abiding is about being in a place where one remains close. Verse 2, and it says, go near to listen rather than to offer to the sacrifices of fools, where relationship is sustained. And there can be an element of waiting as well. So it is the sake of abiding is, in one essence, the placing. And not so much, it doesn't always have to be something physical, but in the sense of a nearness and a closeness with God um, and positioning and remaining close. And in the sense that we have an established relationship with Christ through salvation, abiding is the sense of it continuing and sustaining. And there's an element of waiting as well in the sense that when it comes to talking, as we do in communication with each other, it's the same way of listening and receiving um, besides just giving. And that's the sense of waiting and really more of a sense of not just doing anything, but more of an awaiting and awaiting what God has. So one of the examples I want to use for abiding is when we talk about abiding for the things of the Lord. And one of the, one of the near and dear uh, stories in the Bible that I think of when it comes to abiding is easily Mary and Martha. And if we can go to Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42, we find both of them with Jesus at the home of Martha and Mary. And 38 says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that he that had, to, that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. 
So when we, when we examine the sense of Martha and Mary, we see that Martha is preparing. She's striving, right? Even though it's the things of God and even that's something to the sense of helping and, and wanting to prepare things for God, specifically uh, for the sake of the home, she's striving. She's putting in the sense of what we said in the definition. Uh, she devoted a serious effort and an energy, right? She, stro- she strived. And there was a struggle in it to the fact that she even felt a sense of overwhelming. And she even asked the Lord, look what Mary is doing. Why is she helping me? Lord, look look what's happening. And God, what I find interesting in this as I flip over, Jesus did not point out to the fact of her serving, but what she was really in in a sense of emotion, in a sense of, of how she was serving. He didn't really just judge and specifically speak on what she was doing, for we already seen that. And Jesus pointed out about her being worried and upset about many things and not serving, and he identified the bigger issue at hand. And that's one of the bigger flaws and one of the bigger traps when we strive. We have that sense of a worrying and upset because we're doing it in our own strength. We're continuing to go on and on and on. And I like this story specifically because on a, on a basic um, messes of it. A lot of people see certain things when it comes to ministry, when it comes to the things of God. And there's a sense of striving and there's a sense of striving. And they think, you know what, well, this is a thing of God, you know, not, nothing's going to go wrong, I'm okay. And the thing is that when we do these things, I'll get more into what I mean when I say this, when we do things like ministry, when we do things like serving God, we don't do it for the sake of we're just doing things for God. We do it in a partnership with God to bring Him glory. So she strived to keep things in order for Jesus that she neglected being with Jesus. And that was one of the big things, and I'll get to Mary soon. But the gist of that was that busy lives of service distract us with spending time with God and listening to his word. And I can even state that for myself because one of the big things I have a heart for of is, is ministry, is of serving. And I love serving my church. I love serving my family. I love serving my local community. One of the big problems that I had or I have still, and I actually, it was funny because I spoke with one of my, my brothers in Christ, and we had a, a whiteboard, and uh, a, dry erase, a dry erase board. And in that board, they had me from year to year of what I was doing, how I was serving, and what I was doing. And specifically with that, the whole meaning was that was, hey, you know, what were you doing? How did you feel? And everything like that. But I had this sense of, man, I feel overwhelmed. I feel like, you know, this is a huge way. I feel like I'm doing too much. And funny enough, there was a comparison, I believe it was from the year before and, and, and this year. And all that I was doing in the sense of ministry and all the sense of just helping out in service in general, the list got bigger. And I realized even though I had a heart for these things, I wanted to continue with these things, my, my, my main mission in all these things were not just to do these things, just to say I did it or just to, you know, just to serve a purpose. But my thing was I was supposed to, to also serve and, and partner with God on these things so I know specifically what he has me to do and, and not for the sense of a burnout but to specific, specifically um, minister and specifically serve those that he had and one of the big things too that I did not realize is when I was doing those things I was doing what Martha was doing to where I was just doing it and I was getting worried and I was getting upset and one of the things that I, I remember uh, happening, um, looking at it, was just as I was finishing these things, not only was I physically weary, but I was just saying, Lord, you know, what's going on? Why am I not feeling this? Why is there not a fulfillment? Why isn't things happening? Where's the solutions? And one of the biggest things, too, is that I realized not only that times that I not pray and talk with God about these things of whether I was supposed to be doing it or not was the fact that I did not see God in the midst of these things. I didn't take those times when I was away from church, when I was away from helping those in the community or my family to to spend time with God. And good works should flow from a Christ-centered life. They do not produce a Christ-centered life. And when we give Jesus the attention he deserves, he empowers us to serve others. So just as I was saying, the good works, they flow from our Christ-centered life to where when I was doing these ministries, I'm doing it out of the kindness, and not even just the kindness, but because of what God has done and for who he is, and that's how I serve. And in the sense of Martha, that when we get weary, when we get upset, the way to combat that and the way to truly give those things over to God as we do it, so we do it in joy and in those fruits of the Spirit, is to remember God and to also spend time with him and thank him. And we'll get into that even more. But for Mary, her portion, as Martha was making preparations, her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. And Jesus stated this about Mary. He said, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. And I find it interesting. When we're striving, we tend to be at loss. And if all doesn't go our way, or even as we do, 
um, even as we do it as it's planned, and if we stress, other unpleasant factors can affect us. So when we're striving, even for the sense of, of Martha, and I'll even go back to that verse of what uh, Jesus was saying, the sense of striving, the sense of just doing things out of our own might, there's no rest. There's no sense of, of partnering with God, like I was saying, there was no sense of remembering what we're doing it for, and we're just doing it to get to a result, and that's not what God has for us. Jesus said, Mary had chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. And it's in the sense of when you look at what's on your plate. It could be ministry, it could be, you know, anything else outside of that. But what's on your plate? It is always better, yes, to give and devote what you're doing to God. But if you're not being able to spend that time with God, even in the sense of the business, Mary then joined Martha in the sense of preparation. She let Martha do her thing, but her main her main objective, her, her, where her heart was at, her passion at the time was to sit at the feet of Jesus. And she had chosen what was better, and it would not be taken away from her. And this is what it means by that. When we abide, we receive a satisfaction and a fulfillment. That's continual. Abiding is not a one-time thing, so the same strength and energy and time that you would use to put towards striving in your own might, you give to God and abide in his ultimate strength, not your own finite might. So the thing that Mary was doing was not only sowing a seed and, and, and a sowing of, of rest and, a, and a, um, abundance and abiding for that one time, but it was something that we have to continue to do as believers, as Christians, that we don't just abide in God one time. We continue to do it continually. And in the sense that we give um, our time and our essence, God is able to fill us in that, in that time as well. So that's for the things of God. Now, abiding when we are in need. I know this is a huge thing because when it comes to in need, whether it is the sense of a healing, whether it is the sense of, uh, you know, something that we, that we aspire for could be materialistic. A lot of people like to go and do it in our own strength of a striving, and that's based on the sense of it could be instant gratification. It could be the sense that um, we, you know, we want, we want it now, so we just want to go out and do it ourselves and, uh, a quote just kind of came to my mind. If you want to, if I can remember it, if you want to go um, fast, go alone. If you want to go farther, go with, go with uh, a group, go with others. And that was one of the big things when I think about abiding is if you want to just go out and do it on your own and get through it fast, um, the thing about it too is you may not complete it in the way that God wants you to or even at all, but when you do it with God, when you abide and let God um, drive you to where the destination you need to go, you go a lot farther and you walk within your purpose. So John chapter 15, verse 4 to 7 says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, and neither can you bear fruits unless you remain in me. Chapter 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And I like breaking down verses just so we get a better context of it and be able to, to speak on it. So when it says remain in me and I in you, right, one of the big things to, to, to take from that is it's I and me, it's in, uh, remain in me and I in you. It's a mutual Abiding is mutual. As we remain in Christ spiritually, he remains in us and strengthens us and gives and, and has an opportunity to give us that life. Um, and the verse says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, and neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And those who abide in Christ must continue for if they, as they do, they will be sustained. It was the same thing I was saying before. As we abide in God, there's a, there's a sustenance, there's a, there's a, a sustaining factor that he allows to, to, um, into our lives as we, as we abide in him. We cannot sustain ourselves, and it's the number one downfall when we try to do it in our own might. And when we bear fruit from the produce of Christ, not in our own effort, uh, God multiplies it, and he allows us to be fruitful. And when we abide in Jesus, abiding with Jesus is where the believers grow in righteousness and where that individual begins to do good works for the kingdom of God. And even to the sake of, it wasn't the fact that Martha uh, was doing something heinous or, you know, something of, 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 a, of a, vill a villainous crime or anything that she was doing, but the fact that it was all about priority and also, you know, what priority she chose and how it affected everything. And that was the one big thing is abiding and, and doing it and living it out. 
So when I think of abiding in, in a life application, when we take what abiding is and we take it out into, the, into our churches, when we take it out to be beyond the four walls of the church, one of the big things I, I think of is uh, that method of prayer. Actually, Brother Jolio spoke on this before. The uh, acronym ACTS, uh, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. So when we think of adoration, right, it's worshiping God, it's praising God for who he is and approaching him in love first and foremost. And one of the verses that come to my mind is when it comes to true worship, which I enjoy, and that's John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. And as it says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And when I think of, or when I, when, I, when I say spirit and in truth, I think of two things within the sense of worship, that worship comes within a sense of an, an attitude and a sense of an act. And in the sense that when we worship God in attitude, it is, it is in the sense of, it is a sense of, of truthfulness, of spirit. It's his spirit connecting with ours. And with the act of it is, it's doing it in truth and is doing it in reverence of God. In, in adoration, we acknowledge who God truly is, so that's specifically where it is. When we think of abiding, one of the big things we want to do is have that, that adoration for God, have that sense of going back to our first love. A confession, being in an agreement about our sins and asking for forgiveness and are vulnerable as well as truthful. It's, re it's relationship maintenance. It's the sense that when we know that things are going wrong in our lives, we don't hide our shame. We don't throw our guilt we don't, we don't throw down our sins and, and try to bury it in the sand. We reveal it to God and go to him with forgiveness, knowing that he will forgive us. We're, we're making it known. We're not fixing ourselves. We're giving our sins over to uh, uh, the one who, who, can, who can make us whole, and that's the relationship maintenance. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 reads, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. but We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And even in the sense of that, even when we're sinning, even when it's blatant sin or, you know, when we, when we you know, for Christians, we, we do not live in that sinful nature, but we still commit the acts of sin based off our, 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 fleshly, our fleshly nature. So when it comes to the sense of, of revealing that sin and, and, you know, having that sin and casting it out, we, we approach God's throne of grace with confidence, knowing that in our time of of need he will heal us as well as forgive us first john chapter 1 verse 8 to 9 says if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness so when we acknowledge our sin before him through Christ, we know that we will be forgiven. We don't try to, to fake it. We don't try to make it to where our sin is not there. We give it over to God because that's part of the confession. That's when we know we give him that adoration. And as we do that, we confess and, and give over what was wrong and make it right in God's eyes because we love him. And Philippians chapter 4, 6 to 7 says, do not be anxious about, and, oh, sorry. We, uh, as, as we, we had adoration, we had confession, and then T would be thanksgiving. So thanksgiving uh, states, we thank him for what he's done. We can thank him for forgiveness, what we have, who we have, relationships, and where we are at in our lives. And now Philippians 4, chapter 6 to 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Chapter 7 says, in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. And in that sense, we are giving over to God uh, the sense of just thanking him for, for who he is and for what he's done. And anything that is anxious, anything that is, that is in us, uh, we cast that out. But we also, um, in, in every situation, in every prayer, petition, we give that to God. So we're, we are still petitioning, but in the same sense, we are thanking God just for, for life, just for what he has given us and, and what he will get us to, and just specifically getting back to the heart of God. So in Thanksgiving, we acknowledge his thanks in all given circumstances. So even when things are going bad, even when we are truly low in the valleys, we are still doing these things of giving adoration, confessing, and thanksgiving to God, because we don't only do it when things are, are you know, 
going good or even going bad, but we do in all given circumstances because God is with us no matter what the circumstance. And then our last one was supplication of, of acts. So we have adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And supplication states making our requests known to God. So it's a part of when we have those desires and we have those requests that we want to pray to God based off of this method for prayer is when we make those things known to God. And then here, we, it was when we bring him our needs and our worries, we ask him to work on our behalf or on the behalf of our loved ones on our nation or those who don't know him. And Ephesians 6, 17 to 20 backs it up in, as it speaks of the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God. And as it says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. In the sense of stepping out. One of the big things I was actually, when I was at, on a college campus, there was a, there was a it was a Christian organization, and one of the big missions that we had when we were evangelizing and speaking the gospel on our campus was these two mantras, and it was to be bold and intentional for Christ. And even in the sense of the request to God to know that there's no prayer too little, there's no prayer too big, and there's nothing to where we should feel ashamed, there's nothing that we should feel that, oh, Lord, you know, I, I want to just pray for this person and not me. There's a sense of false humility that, that, that goes around that is not right, that is not true. And I know in, in that person's heart when, they, when it's – usually I see that within, you know, family members or loved ones. It could be a parent, and they say, you know, I don't want anything from God. I just want to make sure, you know, my child is healthy. And that's fine. But one of the big things is God wants to know your request as well. He also cares for your child or your loved one as well as you. And to, to let you know that, you know, false humility uh, does not need to be – not, does not need to be there. God has enough. He, he, he is enough, and he can listen and, and act and work upon more than just one prayer. Um, it's not a wish. So in supplication, we acknowledge that the Lord hears our needs, and we submit it to his greater knowledge and love, knowing that he will do it. And the quote-unquote method within that is that we say that and we speak in supplication of our request, knowing that he hears us. That is the one big thing, and I'll even say not just hears, but listens. Like, one of, the, one of the things that, that we, I feel like we lack in society and community are people coming together and listening. We have, um, you know, whether I go into a, a political realm or, or different things in this world, everybody seems to, start, or not everyone, I don't want to generalize, but many people in this world want to just talk to people to just let it out or they want to be able to case bind in the sense that they're able to just speak and then also hear to a point to what they're saying and just say it back and lash out. When there's a sense of love, when it comes to supplication, when it's given over to God, he listens, he hears, he has a heart for what you have a heart for. And it's a submission. So when you have that supplication, when you have that sense, even in the sense of abiding, when it comes to supplication, we submit it to God knowing that he has greater knowledge, meaning he knows he's wiser, he knows more, he knows what to do with it. And there's a greater love to where even if we love something dearly and we desire it, or even if we have a heart for it, God has an even bigger heart for it and has a bigger plan for it. Knowing that he will do his best with it is also the promise, knowing that as you give, as you give your supplication away, or even in the sense of seasoning of, of abiding in something, and, and, and you're making a request, you know that he will do what is best. And as humans, we only see a, sm you know, a, a, a small piece of the pie. We only see pieces, but God knows the big picture. So for supplication, uh, when, uh, in supplication, in that sense, we give it over to God and know that, that he, he, is, he is just. And when we are in need, we run to God instead of create our own solution. So when it comes to abiding in the sense of comforting, I think of a, of a actually it was a song, it was a lyric, uh, the lyrics I'll even say, it was from a song, More Than Anything by Natalie Grant. And the lyrics go, help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the Savior more than the saving. Help me want the giver more than the giving. And help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. And even to the point to where Natalie was saying in her lyrics that she's going back to the heart of God. She's going back to when it comes to in the sense of when I'm using the example of abiding and really doing that. We're not just doing that for the sense of things happening for us or just wanting certain attributes of God or certain things that, that are of his, his functions. We want God completely. So when she says, help me want the healer more than the healing, in that sense, you think of someone who wants a healing, and that's, and that's something that, that is naturally acceptable to ask God of. 
But we don't just ask just for the healing to be finished and manifested and that's it and we leave God alone and never speak to him again until there's another problem. No, we love God for who he is and he is a healer who heals and his function is healing, but we love him uh, whether the healing is there or not and also that we believe that he heals. Same thing with a savior as, as we accept Christ as Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, even when it comes to the sake of being in a dilemma or a turmoil or some kind of uh, issue and being saved from it could be persecution on different levels, especially in, in, in our culture here. Um, knowing that Jesus is the Savior and loving him for being the Savior and, and, and specifically saving us even when we are a wretch. Loving him even if the saving comes, even if it doesn't, but also believing that he will do that is loving him basically. Same thing with help me want the giver more than the giving. And this is huge because I look at our culture, I look at our country, I look at how we are, you know, materialistic things and how we like to hoard things. It's funny, there's even a show called Hoarders when you go into a house and there's all big things all over the place and it's just, it's a mess. Um, but the sense of giving, God, God is a, a one who, who can give and take, but when it comes to the giving, a lot of people want to go to God with their hands out. And when they get it, they want to turn their back and not give him the glory for who he is, but so that's why we give him the praise as, as a giver, not just for what he can give us, but for the fact that he has that ability, he does that out of love and that he, he loves and, and that's where it generates from. And help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. And when it comes to the different functions that we spoke about, of healing, saving, giving, and even more things, we, at the core of, of our purpose, at the core of, of abiding, we want more of Jesus. And when we find our comfort when we want uh, we find our comfort when we want Christ for who He is and and free ourselves from our own restrictions. We don't put God in that box when we truly love God for specifically who He is, um, and that's for that's for that abiding. And another thing I thought of too, um, even specifically in my life, is what happens when you when you um, are looking to abide for life direction or you're looking forward to abide for a new aspiration. It could be ministry, you could be moving, you could be uh, moving in, into a, a different realm altogether. But um, one of the big things to understand is the greater the call, the greater the preparation. And I had to think about that and I said, you know what, because there's a lot of things that I, I have asked in supplication and petition to God about. And my biggest thing was why? Why not now, Lord, why not now? And one of the big things that I was even, um, you know, godly counsel was, was speaking to me about and also that I've, I've kind of received from God in my prayer was if, if the call is huge and the call is, is bigger to a, to a, a, to a, to a quantity, to a, to a quality, to where you, you need to be uh, groomed into it, you need to grow in that sense, God needs to prep you. God needs to put you in a sense of, of being groomed into that sense before you are able to, to walk into that call, to be able to walk into that next thing. So just keep that in mind whenever you're thinking of life direction and you're in that state, that state or that season to where you, you're looking to abide uh, in God for, for the sense of that. One of the first things I think of too when abiding in that sense is to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And I feel like a lot of people in ministry hear that all the time or they hear that a lot to where it's like, but I don't want to. And that is allowing God to use you in discomforting assignments to grow you and build you for new directions. So that's not, I'm not saying go out and go do something that's just specifically uncomfortable <clears throat> for the sake that that God is just going to bless it. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about when it comes to certain assignments in your season that God gives you that comes off the flesh and from our own personal being as discomforting, but we know that it will grow us for God's purpose and not for our own. And, it, and just remember to encourage you that the discomfort in that sense is not just for the sake of you got to go through something bad for the sake of it. No, it's for the simple fact that discomfort is, is your flesh dying. For God to grow you, we need to pick up our cross. For God to grow you, we need to, we need to die to self. So that discomfort in that sense of the assignment that God's giving you, it is, it is uh, you being crucified of that flesh. That is what God is, that is what God is doing, and he's working in you. Uh, putting your old self, making way for the new. Ephesians chapter 4, 20 to 4, uh, chapter 4, 20, verse 24. And that specifically was talking about within the sense of coming into Christ, but I'll, you know, want to speak on how that works with the body. So putting the old self, chapter 20, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. 
to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And that's how I was even specifically saying with the sense of getting comfortable with the, with the uncomfortable, which is in the sense that when you do that and you're, you're also being able to, to you know, die of the flesh, God is creating you anew. God is going to be able to, to work in you and bring you to a new stage, bring you to a new growth in your spiritual maturity. And in the same way this was made for Christ during salvation, we need to do the same when it comes to a new season that God has for us. And one of the big things I want to remind all of you who may be going forth into a newer season, looking for a, a new life direction or new aspiration, um, it is actually more for me than, than it is for anything that, that God was speaking to me, but I want to share that out of the kindness of my heart, was to, uh, the building of, of the foundation usually looks different to what you are called to. So I always like that, that saying that if God gave us the whole list of things or even like gave us the, the full picture of what we're supposed to do with our lives, that, that we would just look at it and say, no thanks, and give it back. Because the road that we would take, the things that, that, that would grow us in our stages now and in our minds now, before we even go through it and God puts us through it, we would say no. We wouldn't allow God to manifest and grow us through those things, and even that's how God is, is showing the light, um, the lamp into our feet to where we just see that, that step in front of us and God is to guide us. And by faith, assurance, and, and hope that God will continue and promise and the promises that he has given us to, to go forward, that you know, we trust in it. And the building of the foundation, um, even for the saints, of if you're going into a new season or a new life direction, it looks different because you, you're not accustomed to it. And even for the sense of even what you may be doing, what God may be putting in your path or your assignment, we may look at that and say, how is this building me for this, you know? How is this, you know, if I'm called to be a teacher or a pastor, why am I, why am I scrubbing floors? Or why am I talking with, you know, a certain group of people? Why am I doing this? God may be using you for that sense to build certain character, to build certain things that you bring into that ministry, that you bring into that next uh, season of life. So don't discourage what God is building your foundation um, because no matter what, he's going to move you to what you're called for. He's going to move you, and, he's, and he's, he calls the equipped, so you will be equipped um, at the time of, that is necessary. And one of the other things, too, besides the sense of putting that old self, um, when it comes to abiding for a life direction or a new aspiration, is be on the lookout for devil's schemes. Um, and this is actually was spoken to me by a, a, a brother in, in, in the Lord, and he was actually encouraging me in the sense that he said that if, the, if Satan cannot hold you back, pushing you forward into beyond the point to where you're not focusing and listening to God can also be a trick. And I just thought that was interesting because we usually think of Satan is holding us back or Satan is, is trying to delay. But we don't really think of, of him opening a door, even if it's a trap door, for us to be lunged forward and to be out of reach of what God is trying to do and, and have and be in that sense, in that presence of abiding and focusing. And I found that with me because when it comes to that, I, God had to sit me down and really uh, speak to me about responsibilities and opportunities because I looked at my list of opportunities and what I was trying to do was trying to function and, and do a lot of those things when really it was the responsibilities that God had for me. And the devil and even the enemy was to the point saying that with these opportunities, go out and do this and just try to plug things in for God. And that was a trick to where if I just see something and say, you know what, I'll just plug in, I'll just, you know, I can, I can honor God in this. So, you know, I'll just do it. And hey, that's, that's a thing of God or it's a good thing. And I can move that around for God is I want to circle back around to that thing when I was saying with partnering with God to where we're not just doing things for God because it's something that, that could be a good work and we can throw God's name on it. We partner with God because God has certain assignments and, and, and also he has a vision for us in these things in our lives. And when we partner with him, we hear from heaven and what they're saying and, and what God wants us to do specifically. Um, when you're not focusing and listening to God, it can also be a trick. Uh, pushing opportunities in your way to the point you are not consulting with God and it's busyness. One of the biggest things I realize, even when the sense of us as human beings in this world is that it's not so much that, that we are even um, bored and that doesn't have a lot to do, but we are busy. We are busy like never before. We all have our loads. We all manage it a different way and God has, has is the, the one who manages the loads altogether. But that's one of the big traps that I see today is that yeah, a lot of things in this world, and, and not even so much the devil, but there's things that we kind of busy ourselves up with and we all have our different reasons for, or, you know, different 
different triggers and traps that have happened for it, but we busy ourselves so much that we're not being Mary. We're doing the Martha, we're doing the Martha show and we're not really focusing on Mary. We're not we're, uh, in the same function that Mary do. We're not s sitting at the feet of Jesus to where when we return back to that, God aligns our steps, God allows us to, to work uh, for his, his good, and that's abiding. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, uh, kind of gives a little bit of an explanation for that. It's fixing our eyes, fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that was abiding, abiding for life direction. Now, the third I think about is, is the sense of when we're abiding, of, of truly being able to go back into that sense of abiding, returning back to that. I think we hear a lot of that, you know, returning back to the heart of worship, returning back to God. When it comes to abiding and, and placing yourself back into God, Hosea 10, 12 says, sow righteousness for yourself and reap the fruit of the unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. So sow righteousness for yourself and reaping the fruit of the unfailing love. That is us investing daily uh, obedience. And in that sense, it was a result of experiencing God's never-ending uh, never love and, and conditional sacrificial love. And when it says break up your unplowed ground, I think of hardened hearts. I think of the things that we allow to, to get in, whether it's pride, whether it's fear, whether it's doubt, that hardens our hearts or even our desires um, that we are keeping to do for ourselves and not give it over to God. And that's one of the big things I realized with me was that I was always, when it came to certain things, when it came to certain opportunities, or even uh, if it came to a, a hidden sin or anything that was there, I'd give certain things to God. But my true desires, just picture, picture, picture me and picture uh, someone, I'll say even God, of, of me trying to give him something. And as he's trying to take it, I'm pulling back. That's one of the big things. I have a hardened for my desire. It's not so much that I even have a, that I do have a hardened heart in that sense, but a hardened desire to where I want it for myself and I do not fully trust God to do what he said he will do. And that's one of the things of breaking up your unplowed ground is uh, breaking up that unhardened heart or desire and giving it to God and changing your heart and allow, allow God to permeate through your ground uh, plowing his plans and his heart where yours once was. And it's a sake of giving uh, the sense that God has that ability and that openness to do that. And one of the big verses too, uh, uh, part of the verses that I think of specifically now, even with my life, is until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. And I say specifically that because that is, that is my season of life. And I keep asking God, when, when, when can I do this? until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Okay, Lord, I see this opportunity. When, when can I go for this? Is this something that I truly desire and it's something that I've given over to you? When can I do that? Until he comes and showers his righteousness with you. He will move you into your next step in his time and when he has prepared the, you know, when he has prepared the way for you, um, has given you clearance to do so, he will. And. Um, I just think of it too, because, you know, as human beings, we think and we specifically ask these questions. All right, Lord, how long do I have to stay, uh, you know, stay within the sense of, of, you know, being faithful in my finances until they improve? When is this going to happen? When is that opening? And the answer, until he comes and showers his righteousness with you. Or even to the sake to where it's like, but, but God, how long do I have to wait until I move towards what I believe you, you've called me to? I mean, you, you've, you've called me to that and you, you've put that gift in me. Where's the opportunity? And even as we spoke of the sense of to where God is preparing that way until he comes and showers you with righteousness. And even that same question, Jesus, please, I'm looking for that healing for the loved one. How long do I continue to pray? And that answer is you don't stop praying. You continue to pray. You continue to abide in, in God's healing power and, and, and who he is. But he also will come and shower you in his righteousness on you. And in a sense, with that is where you don't stop. You continue to, to do whatever is in your season that God has given you to do, and it would be even to be, have called you to, to, uh, to stand firm in and be bold and intentional with. But when God is coming, he comes and showers you his righteousness on you. It's God preparing the way. It's God doing these things. We have to be, and I'll say have to, not in the sense of obligation, but it's our duty as believers. It's, it's, it's how we, we walk in this faith. We, we have to be we have to be um, bold. We have to be in, in the space to where God can use us until he comes and showers his righteousness on you and continues to, to go forward. And that's not just for the sense that he, 
that you continue to do something and it just comes. He does that, he does that um, and permeates through your seasons of life. It's not just one big thing that hits at the end of you doing an assignment. He does this within different, within different methods and ways uh, to continue and, and keep you endured for this, this walk. And another is abiding when we need to walk in truth. And the main reason for abiding is that we are partnering with God, right? Is what we were saying. So we need to stop doing these things for God and start doing them with God. And as I was talking about partnering before, I'll specifically explain it more. Partnering with God on what he wants, on what he wants and how he wants to do through us, no matter what the circumstance is. And it's through us that he's able to, to do that. We're not just for the simple fact that we want, you know, this thing to happen for us. But even when it comes to when it comes to our pastor, when it comes to the worship, when it comes to um, the ladies who are praying for us, for for the sake of those who are leading in men's and women's and and nursery and sound and etc., we are partnering with God for the sake that He wants to do a good work in us. We are His we are His handiwork. We we are the the magnificent work that He's created us to do. But we follow His mandate. It's not us. We're the vessels, and we and we out of love and out of respect for and adoration for Him. We follow for what he does, but we don't move in the sense of if unless he has called us forward and, and has given us that mandate, but we have to do it with him. We don't just do it for him. We do it with him. And for those who are abiding when, uh, when they need rest, Hebrews 12, chapter 1 through 3 speaks of this. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so, so that you will not grow weary and lose hearts. And that's what it is. Sin can make us weary, but as we partner with God to break those shackles, they will loosen, and we will get the second wind of running in this life with endurance. If he is for us, who can be against us? And I want to leave you with uh, two things. One is a food of thought from Erwin uh, McMahon as a pastor and an author, and I will close with Ecclesiastes 12, 9, 14. But just something to think of, of some food for thought. Uh, Erwin states, the way you develop this relationship of abiding is your need to keep your roots deep in him. But we all want to bear fruit without going through the seasons. He doesn't want you to need him the way you needed him when you started. He wants you to grow in the depth of your need for him. And that's a part of what's happening in a union with God. He is actually making you whole. And I'll finish with Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 to 14. We deviated from that, from the book specifically this week, uh, because God was, was showing me specifically within abiding and how we wanted to kind of rope with that. But we did start with standing in awe, and we will end with the conclusion of the matter, starting, uh, ending in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 to 14. And it says, not only was the teacher wise, but he, also, but he imparted knowledge to the people he pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. Their collected sayings were firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this word, Lord. We pray as it saturates and stirs into the hearts of many, Father, that it is able to continue to do that, Father God, going in from tonight into tomorrow, Lord, and that we're able to feast on this world, Lord. Multiply not only what I was saying, Lord, but what you were trying to say through me, Father, to reach those specifically, um, to reach people intently, Father God, and we just pray, Lord, that is to reach them lovingly, Jesus. We thank you for this time and, and, and this this season, uh, this series, Lord, that we've done of just, pers oh, you know, what we do to pursue, Lord, which is wisdom, which is uh, purpose, and which is, is, is abiding, Lord. And it is all being able to walk in this life, Lord, with you, partner with you, and to love you, Lord. So we just pray that, Lord, that as we did this series, Lord, that is able to touch someone, Lord, not for the sake of just uh, acclaim, Lord, or just, just adoration of myself, Lord, but for the sake that it is 
helping someone to, to move forward in their walk with, with you, Lord, to be encouraged by you and to draw closer to you, Father. So we just pray for those who are able to come, able to listen, um, or those who are, who are in the highways and, and, and byways, Lord, who are driving home, who are working, who are hearing this, or even those who are seeing this, Father, that it manifests and it, it gives a, a sense of a healing, Lord, and, and even a they were able to give their supplication to you, Father, and that it sustained them, Father. So we thank you so much for the ability to abide, Lord. Uh, we thank you for, for the sense that uh, Martha can still, can still love you and do the, th the things that she, that she can do, Lord, but we want to be the Mary who is able to just sit at your feet, Father. So we pray we're able to do that, and we pray that we did that tonight, Lord. Uh, bless this, this message, Lord, uh, uh, for your, unto you, Lord, and, and for those who, who are listening and for your children, Lord. And we ask in your name we pray, Lord, that you continue to just multiply our Wednesdays, Lord, whoever is up here, Lord, to continue to give the gospel in the right way, fully, wholeheartedly, and lovingly, Lord. We thank you in your name we pray. Amen. This Sunday we have our worship service at 10 a.m. Hope to see you there.